Welcome to today's IQME Safety Centre webinar on lessons from regulators. My name is Trish Kerrin and I'm the Director of the IQME Safety Centre. Today I'm joined by Dame Judith Hackett and Jane Cutler. I'll introduce them in a moment, but I just want to encourage you all to think about any questions you might like to ask them and enter them into the question panel on your screen. I'll be, see, I'll be working my way through these questions after some introductory comments. We'll also be recording this webinar so you'll be able to see it again or share it with your friends and colleagues. It'll be loaded onto the iCME Safety Centre website and our YouTube channel. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers. First, Dame Judith Hackett was the chair of the UK Health and Safety Executive and is also involved in advising governments in the UK and in Australia on reform of building safety regulations. Dame Judith is currently the chair of Make UK and of Ingenuity and a former iCME past president. Judith, welcome. How are you today? I'm fine, thanks, Trish. Good, good to uh, good to be on this webinar, and and good to be sharing uh, sharing my my thoughts with with people today. Great, thank you. Second, we have Jane Cutler, who was the CEO of the National Offshore Petroleum Safety and Environmental Management Authority in Australia. Jane is currently on the board of the Australian Maritime Safety Authority and is currently the deputy president of ICME. Jane, thank you for joining us. How are you today? Very well, thank you, Trish, and I'm looking forward to um, hearing from Judith and hearing some questions from our audience. Great, thank you. So prior to their regulatory roles, both Jane and Judith worked in industry, so they certainly have an enormous valuable amount of experience from both the industry side as well as the regulator side to share with us today. So I'd now like to invite each of them to share their thoughts on major hazard management from their different perspectives. So Judith, you've been doing a lot of work to establish the new regulations and a regulator for building safety in the UK. How do you think that major hazard management principles can assist with this task and improving the building standards? And how can chemical engineers help in that? Okay, uh, well, that, I think this is a really interesting question and it's it really uh, summarises the journey I think I've been on for the last three years since I took on this role of, of reviewing what was the problem with building regulations here in, in the UK, first of all, and then subsequently be, became involved, as you say, in Australia as well. Um, and it, it's really made me think long and hard about what is the purpose of regulation? Why is it there? What is it trying to do? Um, so I just want to start by going through that, then thinking about how we apply that as chemical engineers to major hazards and then translating that into what it means for building safety. So very often people focus on the regulator and is, is the regulator tough enough? But I think we have to recognize first and foremost that regulation is about a system. It's a system to drive the right behavior. Yes, it needs an effective regulator, but what does an effective regulator look like? Yes, they have to be tough when they need to be, um, but they also have a really, uh, the good regulators, and I, I hope Jane will agree with this, are the ones who are smart enough to help and advise and support those who want to do the right thing and save their uh, punishments, if you will, their sanctions for those who take chances and in doing so put other people's or their own lives at risk. So being able to, a good regulator is able to differentiate between the good and the bad and, and apply their, the tools of their trade, as it were, accordingly to the right people. But a good regulatory system needs other things too. It needs those incentives to do the right thing we need to be able to articulate why it's a good idea to do the right thing. And it also needs to have sanctions that are actually meaningful, that will discourage people from taking those chances, putting people's lives at risk. You need to have clarity of roles and responsibilities, and you need a clear statement of what is the outcome we're trying to achieve here? What is it we want to do? And for all of us, I think in chemicals, in any of us who've, who've worked in the, in the chemical engineering profession, we're very clear and always have been that that goal, that outcome we're trying to achieve is prevention of injury and loss of life. 
So if you think about that in terms of major hazards, why do we have particular regulation for major hazards? Well, I, th I think it's come about, and certainly if you look at the history of what's happened, it's come about because we all have, or all had, a propensity to think it wouldn't happen to us or an inability to think about what is the worst that could happen. And certainly, if you look back at events like Cervezo, uh, Flixborough here in the UK, Piper Alpha, all of those things, when they happened, there was this sense of, wow, we didn't think it could be that bad. And so major hazard regulation came about because we all needed to have that discipline and that framework to look at just how bad could this be? Because only when you have your head around just how big the risk is, can you manage it. If you don't understand the risk, you can't manage it. So you, the approach has to be proportionate to the risk. That's why for higher hazards, major hazards, you need a higher level of regulatory hurdle to get over, which we call the safety case permissioning regime. And really, what that permissioning regime is all about is saying to people, show me that you know what you're dealing with here, show me that you have thought about how to minimise the risks, and also show me that if the worst really does happen, you have plans in place to mitigate it. And we can talk about all the other things that go with that. And, and Chemical engineers know all about management of change and all of the layers of protection and all of that that are built up around it. But that's what's at the heart of, of major hazards regulation. If you then move on to the work that I've been doing on building regulations, it's a very different system, a very, very different system that's in place both in the UK and in Australia. It's partly because it's a very much more fragmented industry. And one of the ways in which the regulators therefore have tried to deal with that fragmentation in the industry is to put more and more layers of prescription in place. But if you go back to what I said about what you need for a good regulatory system, which is about clarity of roles and responsibilities, someone who has the overall oversight of the whole process, if those things are not in place, which is what you have currently in building systems, then you get bad outcomes. And we know what mm -hmm. bad outcomes look like. Grenfell Tower, of course, was the worst possible example of that. But there have been horrible fires in Australia and in other parts of the world too. And we know that that problem is not just about using the wrong materials, and being able to get away with using the wrong materials, but it's also about poor workmanship, people not feel, feeling ownership, people not knowing how safety critical the work is that they're doing, um, only seeing their small bit of the job and not seeing that in the broader context. And quite extraordinarily, I think for us as chemical engineers, any kind of process of ensuring that a building is safe almost stops at the point of occupation. And if you think about high rise buildings with many, many people in them, very few of them have clear roles and responsibilities defined for who's going to manage that as that building is used. And I think we can all see that people in a building, I hope people on this webinar can see that people in a building are a bit like raw materials to us, the chemicals inside the process, if you will. So what we're trying to do right now is shift a whole industry sector to seeing this systems process approach, which to us as chemical engineers is second nature. We've been taught and trained to think this way. It came as a surprise to me to realize that other engineering disciplines don't get it yet. And so the real challenge is we need to teach them. There's my okay. starter. No, thank you. I think there's some really interesting um, interesting things to, to explore in that. I might just ask Jane though, um, so you're the incoming president for iKimi and you're then going to have quite an influential position within iKimi and its direction at that point. So what would you like to see happen in major hazard management 
in industry and how do you think that ICME could be supporting that? Okay, thanks Trish and thanks Judith for a, a great um, kick-off introduction to our conversation. Um, I think a critical thing for industry is to pay attention to the lessons of the past and to challenge itself as to whether those lessons have been really learned. Um, because every time um, in a high hazard industry we get a new event, we realise it is actually the same accident incident that we've had before. It's just unravelled slightly differently in a slightly different location to a slightly different group of people. Um, so it appears sometimes that we're having the same accidents over and over again. So I'd encourage industry also not to get too bogged down in low, thinking about low frequency events and going it'll never happen. High consequence low frequency events happen eventually and we don't know whether one in a thousand years or one in a hundred years is going to happen tomorrow or actually in a hundred years time after whatever it is we're talking about has been decommissioned and um, is no longer functioning so it's good. Um, I think the other thing I would say to industry is we need to be absolutely clear risk is a lot more than the numbers. It's a lot more than some engineering calculation of how frequently something might occur and what might happen if it did occur. It's actually also about outrage. So risk, if you like, equals hazard plus outrage. And community expectations on organisations are increasing, which means the outrage risk is increasing as well. So in evaluating whether a particular low frequency consequence, exploding oil rig or burning high rise building is acceptable or tolerable, um, we actually need to think much more holistically about how we're going to minimise that, that risk. I would encourage industry to reflect periodically on some of the lessons in the past in detail. Lord Cullen's report back from Piper Alpha days is now available free on the website. Trish, I think you have something to do with making it available at zero cost. So thank you on behalf of the communities of the world. I'd encourage you to take a look at it from time to time um, because it's got some important lessons for us all. No platform is an island. It's, it's connected, it's part of the system and we must use system thinking otherwise we don't actually solve the right problems. And that's not just thinking in the oil and gas sense of the hydrocarbon systems, it's thinking about the communication systems and all the systems that go into supporting a particular process activity. We also need to consider the big picture over the, the whole life cycle. So it's, it's not just sort of designing at a point of time and designing something for a 20 year life and then finding we want to use it for a few years more and going, well, it's okay, it was um, appropriate safety systems at the time. Well, things have changed. The equipment's deteriorated. It's had bits put on, taken away. So we need to think about the big picture over the entire life cycle. And I think that goes back to what Judith was saying about the building. Um, is once people occupy it, it's sort of forgotten. Um, similar sort of thing. And systems thinking to me is at the core of chemical engineering and therefore should be at the core of iChemE. And I guess the starting point for that is at university. So one thing that I would hope that ICME focus on in the future is actually encouraging academics, courses, people preparing and training the chemical engineers of the future to tie system thinking into everything and to tie it in um, and sorry and to teach it explicitly as well as tying it into all the other things. So it, both is required. You can't say, well, we don't teach it as a focus area. 
Um, I see ICME also needing to be a, a voice in process safety and system thinking and encouraging it to be integrated across curriculums, but not just chemical engineering. It should be a mandated element for all disciplines of engineering and improve our learnings from the past. And again, this is all disciplines of, of engineering. And that's not just from incidents, accidents, that's from near misses as well. Because what a near miss is, is an accident, except that things being slightly different. Yeah. Um, so the difference between fatalities, pollution, impact on communities, it, it's not something that was necessarily designed in, it's just people were incredibly fortunate on the day. Um, but I do think industry has a particularly important role in taking lessons from the past and moving them from being a lesson of the past into good practice and then into common practice mm -hmm. and um, would encourage them to do that. And I guess I'll reflect one fear as we talk in a very positive sense about all the good things that technology and digitization and artificial intelligence and big data and all of this can do for us is that we don't get so absorbed in the data and the information that we lose sight of the physicality and the physical realities and constraints of the situation. And we can all think of, of incidents where the data was giving warnings, people didn't want to read those warnings and they would lost sight of the physics of the situation that they're about to lose control in the process. Um, so I guess that's my introductory comments. I think um, the other area where ICME has a particularly important role is around lifelong learning or continuous professional development. It's saying that skills that you walk out of university with is a start, it's not the end point. Um, continuing professional development is essential and would really encourage everyone to recognise the value of going through the process of technical skills development, but also their commitment to professionalism and the ethical underpinning that should be required when an engineer obtains their chartered status. Um, and I think it's really important that we recognise that um, walking out of uni with a degree is the start of a journey or it's a milestone on the journey which needs to continue through professional life. And I think that's a really valuable contribution that I can make and make. Okay, thank you for that. I think it was interesting that there were certainly some parallels in, in what I heard from both of you. I certainly heard a lot about systems thinking from both of you. Uh, and, and I think that that is a, a key a key area going forward, obviously, that we do need to, to continue to focus on. We've actually had some questions come in, so I might actually switch to some of the questions that we've had come in from our audience at this point in time. Um, so someone's asked uh, to both of you, what do you think are the best ways of measuring the effectiveness of a regulator? How should a regulator assess its own performance? Jane? Well, I think first of all, is to clarify what is expected of a regulator. So um, as Judith alluded to already, there are um, regulators that take a risk-based or a goal-setting approach because that's what's established in their regulations. And there are others who have a more prescriptive set of re regulations to deal with. And I think how you would approach measuring the effectiveness is, a, um, is fundamentally different in those two scenarios. But one of the things is to be clear on roles and responsibilities. Um, and the underpinning of some regulatory systems is that those that create the risk are best placed to manage the risk. And the role of the regulator is to provide assurance to communities and governments that what organisations said they would do, for instance, in the safety case, they are in fact doing. So it's an assurance um, role, if you like. And then if things go wrong, they need to investigate 
work out what went wrong, did someone break the law and hold them to account. So I think you need performance um, criteria, if you like, on all of those things. But as a starting point, you actually need to equip your regulator properly. Because if you don't equip them to do the job, how can you expect them to do a job well in the, in the first place? So I think there's a number of critical factors. One is um, independence. They need to be properly resourced. They need to have a critical mass of skilled and experienced staff in order to challenge industry to do a good job. So basically, if you expect an individual, no matter how skilled and how dedicated, to be the only expert in a particular area for 3,000 kilometres or whatever it is, it's hard to expect them to do a good job. You need a peer group. You need the structures and systems to, to hold people to account. Um, so if you've got all of those things in place, um, I think then you can actually start um, assessing. And I think some of the tools that are used, like you know, how many days do you take to give an approval, um, is, is actually not a good indicator. It's much more around are you giving approval for the right reasons based on appropriate evidence, um, as opposed to some subjective arbitrary basis. I could probably talk about this for a long time, so Judith. Absolutely. Judith, do you have any thoughts on this one? Well, I certainly agree with a lot of a lot of the things that Jane said. Independence is important, properly resourcing and having the right skills and, and sufficient funding to do the work, all of those things are really important. Um, but I think in, in addition to that, for me, it's about that one of the best measures of an effective regulator is public confidence. Um, more and and that's something that I think is really worth people in industry thinking about, and that's why that things like independence are so important because if people feel that the regulator is has been captured by industry, well, that, and that's certainly the case in buildings. I think that's where people are in their heads right now. They think you know, the the building regulator is more on the side of the the people who do the building than the people who live in them. And, and that's not a good place to be. So, so for me, that that public confidence in the work of the regulator is a really important measure. Um, I, I think there. Are, I'd, I'd also cite as one of the examples of what I don't think is necessarily a good measure, but one that a lot of people use is how many prosecutions does a regulator take? Does that demonstrate effectiveness? And the answer is up to a point, but only up to a point. And if the number goes down, it doesn't necessarily mean they're sat, they're sat back doing nothing. It actually means something different to that. And, and you know, as I said, there's, there's part of this job that is about helping people to do the right thing as much as it is about holding those to account who do the wrong thing. And that, that helping people to do the right thing is the bit that's hardest to measure. Okay, thank you for that. I've got another question. Um, a question on MOC and has ID relating to creeping change and distractions. We're seeing a tremendous amount of change through COVID with organisational restructure, asset end of life extension, cost pressures, etc. We continue to relearn lessons associated with MOC and hazard identification. What advice do you have to industry and regulators to maintain a laser focus on these process safety fundamentals through these challenging times? Who wants to take that one? You can go first this time, Judith. Okay. Well, I, I think I think it's I think it builds on on what Jane was saying earlier about um, change is constant, and whether that change is coming about because of artificial intelligence or big data, or whether it's as a result of the sort of massive change we've seen in the way we all work because of, of COVID or whatever it is, we must recognize that that is exactly what it is. It is change. And therefore we need to apply the disciplines that we know and understand, not just to physical change. And I think we're all pretty good at recognizing when we put a new piece of pipe in or a new piece of equipment in that that's some MOC that needs properly managing and risk assessing and so on. 
the same rules need to apply to organizational change uh, and and to to thinking about whatever is happening in society and the way that that is impacting upon the way we work and and um, what impact that could have on major hazards. Okay. I think yeah. one of the big things that lots of companies are dealing with right now, for example, is that as many, many more of us are working from home. We mm. used to talk about cybersecurity risks within the workplace. We've just magnified that several times over yes. by now having many, many people working from home on less secure systems. Mm. Very true. Jane, anything you'd like to add? Um, I think when you make a large number of in incremental changes, each one of them small in, in quick succession, it's really important um, from a, a management and leadership perspective to occasionally allocate the resources to draw breath and say, take a big picture systems approach to evaluation of the risk, maybe not every micro, but certainly the big risks and say, have we made a step change in our risk in some way as a, as a consequence of all of these small changes? And that's a difficult thing to do in a resource-constrained environment, which many people and many organisations are, are working in. But um, some uh, regulatory environments build in that, you know, after five years or after two years or um, after a certain trigger of amount of change or whatever, a more holistic review is required. And that's what I'd encourage people to actually flag. Um, you know, if, you're, if you've got a wide span of control and you're looking over a large number of things, you're actually relying on your people to put their hands up and say, well, perhaps we've, we've done enough, enough change and we need to pause and see if there's an incremental change or exponential change in risk for some reason. Okay, thanks for that. We've actually, uh, we published a paper early on during COVID around various different lessons that industry has learned over this time and ways they've adapted to doing different things. So that's available uh, free on the ISC website. And we're currently drafting one to try and understand what a range of different regulators around the world, how they've approached their inspections and those sorts of activities during this time as well. So we will have a paper coming out on that um, soon too. Uh, no, Judith, I think no, go on Jane. One more thing, one of the challenges for regulators is um, some have had to curtail their physical on-site um, mm -hmm. inspections. Um, yes those that are in more remote, remote locations, but also some where there's lockdowns going on. So work on premises may be continuing, but the, the regulatory focus may not have been there. And so we need to think about how people prioritise getting out into the field, conducting inspections and ensuring if as a regulator, you would try and look at the highest risk stuff first. Um, but it, it's sitting there because it'll very soon be 12 months in some cases where people have gone without an inspection where they may normally get something every six months or, or so on. So um, the ability to take a risk-based approach to allocation of resources by a regulator is pretty critical. Mm, absolutely. Um, I think I think Judith. one thing I would add to that, Trish, is that that um, and I've 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 been saying this a lot in in the context of the building work I'm doing is don't wait for the regulator to tell you what to do or to make you do it, and there is no reason at all in major hazards industries in particular why the organisations and the responsible people within those organisations cannot and indeed should be triggering a safety case review for example on the basis of let's look at what's changed in the last 12 months and what that's done to our safety case it doesn't mm. have to be driven by the regulator no absolutely true absolutely i've got a question I, here for you Judith, around sorry jan i'll move on to the the next question i've got a lot coming in <laughs> at the moment um how many of the 53 recommendations that you made post grenfell have been implemented to date, only a handful, but the regulation is currently under scrutiny. The, the bill is, is currently under scrutiny in Parliament that will implement them all. Okay, great. 
and we're going to have a, a completely new building safety regulator which will be part of the health and safety executive nice good that's good progress i think from such a tragedy hopefully we have managed to institutionalize those learnings for the future uh, another question, what advice would you offer operators of high hazard facilities for managing their risks in a cost cutting environment arising from low oil prices and other pandemic related cost cutting? What about continued training of people during this time? Either of you want to weigh in on that one? I think it's a perennial challenge. You know, we've had periods of low oil price before, not normally overlaid with a, a pandemic. We have in Australia, at least, we have in some areas aging facilities, um, and some of these facilities have been sold over time to organisations with um, less capability. So I guess they're sold to smaller organisations when they become sub economic, some of the larger ones. So it, it's, it's an ongoing challenge, but we can't rely on the regulator to somehow magically wave their wand and in, ensure everything is safe. The regulator can do as much as it can do to prompt challenging questioning and lists of defects and things that require particular work. But the bottom line is um, it actually becomes the responsibility of the organisation, the, the management team and the boards of, of directors, and they have a responsibility in law, but also morally and ethically, to ensure that the facilities that are in their organisation, particularly high hazard facilities, are operated safely. The people mm -hmm. operating them have the skills and the environment um, knowledge and the training in order to operate them safely and they have up-to-date equipment and if, if those things can't be provided you would argue should they be operating. Um, so it is challenging for organisations in tough times um, mm -hmm. but the consequence of getting it wrong can be high, not just for that particular organisation, but for an industry. Um, when there's a major oil spill, it's not just the organisation that's doing the spilling that wears the consequence, it's the environment, it's the communities, it's the health of the people doing the clean up, and it's mm -hmm. every other operator in the industry because suddenly they're all under the spotlight. Okay. I think oh, Jane, Jane's comment of, early, of earlier is very, very relevant here about learning from the past because whatever difficulties we're experiencing now because of low oil prices uh, and ageing assets and so on, that's not a new problem. And if you go back 15 years to when I first started as chair of HSE, we were in the midst of exactly that problem in the North Sea of dealing with several years of neglect of the assets because of low oil prices and the massive amount of work that had to be driven then to get things back up to, up to the right standards and so on. And there's plenty of written reports from that time that if people look back to those, there are lessons to be learned from the past that are equally applicable in today's circumstances. Yeah. If we just take a, a little bit of a journey and talk about lead process safety metrics, do you think that um, they're of use or how important are they for regulators to make sure companies are measuring precursor events and barrier health? I just think they're essential. <laughs> In, in major hazards in particular, you know, given what I said, what are we about? We're about prevention, mm -hmm. not minimising loss when it occurs. The purpose is to prevent it happening in the first place. And the only way to prevent accidents in major hazards is to measure leading indicators. Okay. Yes, agree completely. All right. Um, how can regulators ensure that there's a consistent approach in enforcement decisions in similar circumstances at different duty holder sites? Well, typically 
regulators have a, a certain series of, of tools that fit with their particular piece of, of um, regulation and um, I would expect that they would publish a, a compliance policy that talks about how they're going to use their particular tools and in what circumstances. And the, the suite of tools goes straight from education um, right through to the other extreme of criminal prosecution, depending on the thing. So there's, there's a whole range of things. And the key is to be proportionate for the transgression and um, for the, the risk involved, but also consistent across organisations. But it is rare, the event might appear to be similar, or the, the transgression may be similar, but it is rare that the circumstances leading up to it are completely similar. So you can say um, you speeding, you know, two people get a, a speeding fine for um, doing 100 kilometres an hour, well one's in the 60 zone and one's in the 50 zone, perhaps the consequences should be different. Um, one's doing it um, where it's terribly poor weather and really, really unsafe, the other's on an empty road and so on. So um, organisations have a track record. They have inspection findings which they have or haven't implemented. So a regulatory response often sits very heavily on what the track record has been and not simply on the offence of the moment. Okay, thanks. Judith, you want to add anything to that? No, I, I, I agree. I agree with all of that. It's, I think it, I can understand why people perceive there is inconsistency, but, but I agree with, with, with Jane's comments that previous history of a particular organisation is a factor. What actually happened when you get into the detail may not be the same. So, so things that look from the outside to be similar may not be. Um, I think it's also uh, perhaps not known by a lot of people who are duty holders just how much effort regulators do put into, into trying to drive consistency. There is a very um, strong ethic of peer review of uh, regulatory consistency within the good regulators like HSE. Uh, they do actually look at test cases and get other other inspectors to look at what they would have done and so on to ensure that regulatory consistency is there. Um, I guess the one other factor is, is that whether or not a case is taken to prosecution will be influenced by all of those factors. The one thing that's out with the control of the regulator is the decision that the court then takes in terms of the sanction that is applied. And that bit you cannot, is, is not within the, within the remit of the regulator. It is the court that decides what the, what the fine or the penalty will be. And certainly in addition to that, one of the other challenges is that a regulator can want to prosecute and produce a brief for the prosecutor who decides yeah. not to prosecute because it's not in the public's interest or for various other reasons as well. So it's not Correct. always that the regulator didn't want to prosecute, it's sometimes they just can't. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, a question here on the different uh, regulation schemes of engineers around Australia. So we're now starting to see various states in Australia introduce various different regulatory schemes on engineering registration. What are your thoughts on that sort of uh, application that they're all slightly varying? There's no consistency in that. That's probably more a question for Jane, I guess. Yes, and I, I think it's probably something that I'm not fully nu nuanced across the exact detail in the, the different states, but to me it is a concern um, and it's a concern that it could very easily feel like different attempts to clip the individual's ticket multiple times so they can work across different states. I think it's putting up barriers to opportunity by having multiple systems of, of regulation. And I think in some ways it potentially undermines things like the Charter of Professional Engineer status mm -hmm. if you get misalignment in requirements between that and between the different states. Um, 
and we have to acknowledge and accept that a design team in Melbourne may be doing work in WA one day, South Australia the next, and Northern Territory the next, as well as Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. So presumably an individual needs to hold registration in all places where registration is required. And you say, what is the value to the community of that? And what is the risk that is reduced um, by doing that? Or is it simply like, um, you know, we have multiple systems of driver's license and car registration and, um, you know, even things like health insurance is impacted upon on by where you live. So the joy of a federation. <laughs> yeah. So I think, um, you know, state-based registration um, was probably a work in progress. But then they all go off down the different rabbit holes and then we have a process of harmonisation, um, which doesn't really, well, harmonisation means many things to many people, but it's not often what you think it would mean. Okay, I'm going to switch to a controversial topic for you both. I've actually got a couple of controversial topics showing up in the questions here. The first one is, which is a better regime for managing major accident hazards, goal setting safety case or more prescriptive OSHA PSM style? Um, from my perspective, um, organisations who create the risk are best placed to manage that risk. And therefore that sits, you say, well, if that's the case, can we expect a regulator, or more particularly the policy makers who draw up the regulations, or even more removed from practical world experience in many cases. So I tend to sit firmly in the sense of a risk-based approach, mm -hmm. but that only works if you've got a capable and competent regulator who can challenge the risk. And it doesn't, just because you've got something, a safety case approved, simply means it's met the requirements of the regulation. It doesn't necessarily mean it is safe under all circumstances. So the responsibility goes very much back on to the operator or the organisation to manage the risk. I think for certain things, you need the clarity of a prescriptive set of regulations. Um, where there's a clear um, concentration of a pollutant in the water or pollutant in the air or noise level or something where there is physical data that says beyond a certain level it's hazardous. So, so there's a role for prescription. Um, but Piper Alpha met all the regulations at the time. They were largely prescriptive but it didn't mean the facility when you put all these prescriptive things together was safe. Okay, Judith? I don't think this is controversial at all. <laughs> I, I absolutely agree with goal setting, uh, purpose driven, um, describe the outcome you want to achieve and place the responsibility with the right people to deliver that and absolutely recognize that that is not a one-off passing the test of getting your safety case approved is the start not the end that is your your uh, management bible if you will by which you are now going to manage that process and any changes that you make to it and it has to be seen as be as a very active process I think my experience of dealing with a very prescriptive building regulation system has made me more convinced than ever that uh, prescription leads people to the wrong behaviours rather than the right ones in that they simply do what the rules tell them and it doesn't encourage people to think or take ownership or responsibility. Okay. Uh Industrial manslaughter has come up in a couple of different questions here. So I've got one that's sort of uh, that's asking, have you seen any response from industries as we've seen industrial manslaughter implemented in some parts of Australia? But I'll also tie that question in with what role or incentive do you think this provides to drive wholesale change? And is it an opportunity for reform in the construction industry as well? 
Jane, do you want to have anything to say about I, no, that? I start on that one because of the link to the construction. Okay. Um, we've had, we've had um, it, here in the UK, it's called corporate manslaughter, uh, and we've, we've had it for, for longer now. It, it must be at least a decade since it was introduced here, and there have been very few cases. But those that have, I think most people would look at and say, it's good that we had we had that tool because, again, you have to go back to what's the problem you're trying to fix, and the problem we were trying to fix in introducing corporate manslaughter was the problem of prior to that, in cases where it was clear that an organisation had been behaving recklessly, it was really difficult to pin down the controlling mind. Mm -hmm. And what the corporate manslaughter regulations did was to say, we don't have to find that one individual. We can prosecute the organization for allowing this to happen without having to single out that controlling mind. And so in the cases where you can't pin it down to one individual, you can still hold the whole organization to account and the corporate culture can be found to be at fault. Okay. Jane, do you have any thoughts on some of the recent developments around Australia in this space? Um, I, look, I think it's what is the problem that requ uh, is needed to be solved and if it comes back to this, this sense of community expectations that in certain situations the feeling is that the current range of tools in the regulator's toolkit is incomplete and um, there has to be a lot go wrong before you are in a circumstance where you would apply an industrial manslaughter sort of sanction. Um, but I think it's bringing um, the current work health and safety regulation in line with community expectation when there has been serious failing to protect um, workers. And I think that's a, um, a valuable tool in the toolkit. Um, okay. But as Judith says, I, I think you know it's uncomfortable, um, possibly for boards of directors to to think about it. And um, hopefully, it would encourage the prevention aspect of getting your house in order and preventing occurrence, um, because it helps sharpen the mind. Um, Hopefully okay. it's never, it's a tool as a regulator would never need to really use. That's the hope, yes. Uh, I've got another question for you, Jane. So facilities like FPSOs have major hazards outside of oil and gas production, such as sailing. Um, what are your views on regulator expectations of managing these major hazards? For example, oil and gas users, LOPAs, when marine systems are not designed to shut down, rather keep operating until they reach their destination. What's the jurisdictional crossover between marine and oil and gas regulations? So this sort of brings in your uh, AMSA and NOPSEMA um, experience together. So I guess there's two sorts of FPSOs. Those are fixed in place for the life of the facility unless it has to be, um, you know, they're not designed to be disconnected. And those that um, are, able to be disconnected in the event, usually in the event of a cyclone approaching. So it changes the design parameters for the FPSO because it doesn't have to be resistant or resilient in a cyclone scenario, we can disconnect and go away. There is always challenges because the moment um, when an FPSO is operating, it is a oil and gas facility and it is regulated by NOPSEMA if it's in federal waters and the relevant state authority in state waters. So it's regulated as a high hazard facility. When it is disconnected and mobile, for those that disconnect, it becomes a vessel and it needs to operate under the requirements of AMSA and the relevant maritime legislation. So it actually needs to have the skills and the staff and the systems and procedures and equipment to be able to, to, be able to do both. Um, however, the person in charge could be the same individual, 
but the the legal requirements is there's a different person in charge depending on whether it's being a vessel or whether it's being an oil and gas facility um, because it's full of oil and gas and things it, be a, um, it needs to have the necessary um, um, processes and procedures that it can sail around safely given all the equipment that's on board um, and that's something that would be defined in the safety case, although it becomes a vessel at that time. Um, okay. Not quite sure whether I answered the question, but um, it's the clarity between the two roles is really important. And like any adjoining jurisdictions, um, people get uncomfortable and and nervous about it. So. The clarity is is really important. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Judith, one last question for you now from the audience. The UK Health and Safety at Work Act provides a principle and framework to update a regulatory approach to industrial safety. How would the new buildings regulation do this for the building industry? It will be a, a, a separate bill. Uh, and it will be and the new building safety regulator will be a separate division. Uh, operating uh, within the health and safety executive but there's already a lot of crossover so if if people think about where HSE is already involved in construction uh, they they are very much there to ensure the safety of the workforce during the construction process and indeed during refurbishment work so one of the reasons for bring for, for putting the two things alongside one another is to build on those synergies as well as to transfer into the building safety regulation this thinking around outcomes based placing the responsibility where it should be and what we're having to do alongside making the regulatory framework effective through the passage of the bill is there's a lot of work going into talking to industry about now you've got to make decisions and you've got to demonstrate to the regulator that what you are doing is going to result in a safe building not simply that it meets the rules okay thank you uh so we are running out of time i'm not going to be able to get to any more audience questions i'd just like to ask both of you one last question each and that is what are some of the key words of wisdom you might have to share with younger engineers as they are developing in industry, particularly gaining interest in major hazards and working in that space from your wealth of experience? You want to go first, Judith? Yeah, because I think I think what, what I'd like to just mention briefly in, in closing is that uh, I've spoken a lot about the work I've been doing in construction, but uh, what I'm also doing with the Royal Academy of Engineering right now here in the UK is chairing a whole new uh, work stream that is looking at safer complex systems. And this really relates to what Jane was talking about earlier in terms of everything we do is becoming more interconnected, more complex, whether it be through uh, digital or because systems become interdependent and so on that this whole issue of process safety that has been very much the remit of chemical engineers for a long time is now becoming much more mainstream. Mm -hmm. And so anyone who ever thought about getting into process safety and thinking they were going to be stuck in the process industries, the world's our oyster, guys. You know, everyone is going to need to learn this and they're going to have to learn it from us with us and and there's some huge opportunities out there okay thanks judith jane i would certainly echo what what judith has said um and i i think the the system thinking that that comes with um chemical engineering training is is essential but i also um hope that you actually take something away from our conversation in the sense of um everyone at some level deals with regulators and it's actually not that hard you know listen to what they're saying it might mean reading what they've written on their website 
but also take the time to read at least a little bit of the relevant legislation. I suggest that the objectives of the acts that apply and the set out the overall guiding intent and principles. Um, and it's well worth reading that and it comes at the beginning when it's introduced to Parliament. It's, it's well worth understanding where your regulator is coming from and it's, I guess, it's fundamental approaches underpinning the regulation. And then regulation, the regulators, where human beings don't like surprises, and that applies to management as well as the regulator. Um, we like evidence, so evidence is good, so separate out that, um, you know, the imagination, you know, the fake news from the real news, um, and suggest improvements. Um, they may not get through, but if you've got ideas that you think might be a better way of doing things, um, don't, you know, if you're a manager, don't go, the regulator would never allow it or if you're a regulator don't go mm, not sure it's in the regulation but at least see if it is an improvement so don't use the regulator as an excuse not to be innovative and creative and seek improvement in what you're doing um, because the at the heart of reducing risk and making the companies we all work in safer is actually smart people asking why and the answer is this is the way it's always been or what the regulator says neither of those are very good answers so I'd encourage that questioning and don't let the regulator or the perception of the regulator stand in the way. Okay, well, thank you both for that. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to speak with me today and answer the questions. We didn't get to every question. There's actually still more on the list here. So we certainly got a lot of interest from our audience. So thank you to the audience for your questions as well. You certainly had some great ones for me to ask. So just to let you all know that this will be, uh, this has been recorded and it will be loaded up on the iKME Safety Centre website. That's ikmesafetycentre.org you'll be able to find this webinar in the next day or on our YouTube channel ikme safety centre YouTube channel so thank you very much for your attendance today and your participation both Dame Judith and Jane thank have you. a great day and please all stay safe thank you